So this, uh, well, this lecture actually is bittersweet. I'm sure all of you guys heard, or maybe some of you heard that Eric Pedersen, our strength coach, our beloved strength coach is moving on from us. So he got a really good job at a high performance facility, a private facility coaching Olympic athletes in Charlotte, North Carolina, is that correct? Um, so he is officially done and our amazing GAs are taking over. But I'm saying that because this lecture is, at, I actually developed it with him to present at a conference um, about how to uh, create an embedded sports science program, okay? So when I got to Point Loma six years ago now, um, I didn't know anyone in the, in the athletics department, but I had met Eric, and that's because when I interviewed, of course, I had to get my lift in during that day. So when I interviewed on campus, in between you know, dressing up in a suit and a tie to, to talk to the president and then talk to the department, um, and before lunch, because I knew it was, it was going to be a good lunch, uh, I, I definitely had to go lift. So I went down to the weight room, and sure enough, Eric was down there, met Eric, and we just started chatting. And he was the only person when I got hired that I knew in the athletics department, aside from the soccer coach. And so it was through Eric that I developed this relationship to be able to sort of insert myself <laughs> into athletics from kinesiology and sort of make a bridge. And so you'll see through the course of this presentation how that kind of unfolded and led to really most of the experiences that you guys have with uh, the sports science and monitoring that we have today. So hopefully you'll see that throughout. And I'll do my best to speak to Eric's point of view um, and to represent the strength and conditioning side of things as well, from, both from my experience as a strength coach and then from some things that he's written into the notes as well. Okay, so embedded sports science, building a monitoring program from the ground up because that's what we did. So uh, there's who we are, <laughs> Eric and myself. I had to try to look a little tougher than him in the picture. I don't know if it worked. <laughs> okay, so the agenda for the lecture. First, we're going to go over some concepts. And you guys in the classroom have heard some of these concepts before, definitions of sports science, etc. But I like to lay it out every single time. Next, we're gonna go through some lessons that we learned in this process, obstacles we had to overcome together and um, relying on each of our expertise from the sports science side and from the strength and conditioning side. And then we're going to go into a framework for how each of you, when you get out of here and you go on to a sporting organization or you're a high school strength coach or a collegiate strength coach, how you can actually launch your own monitoring program with whatever means that you have. Okay, so first, concepts. So, I, again, I know this is a review from last week, but we're going to go over it again. What is sports science? So let's break it down, just like last time, and you should be able to fill in the blanks as I'm going. Sport is a competitive activity, as we know, and it requires commitment of everyone involved. Okay? We're not there for our health. As I've said before, you can become actually less healthy doing your sport. All right, last time I used the example of a marathoner, or let's say an ultra marathoner, at the end of a 100 mile race, they are less healthy than when they started, but it's because it's a competitive activity that requires winners and losers, okay? It's a competition, it's not a fitness uh, pursuit. Now science is objective. We observe things, we measure things, we're searching for truth. It's not a philosophical debate, we, we're not just pontificating in the dark, but we're actually getting out there and trying to shed light on what the truth is and get a little bit closer to it every single time. Okay, the basic tenet of science is that there is truth and it can be measured. So those are the definitions of each of those words separately. Put them together, right? And then it's the scientific uncovering of truth in the world of sport, which is a competitive activity. Now, a lot of us are familiar already with exercise and sports science. Um, but I'll go through it again for you. Exercise scientists use exercise or training to understand biology. Okay? They use exercise or training to understand biology, whereas sports scientists use biology and the related disciplines to improve sport. Okay? We see kind of sports science sort of in, inverts or flips the exercise science paradigm, and sport and performance is the ultimate outcome for sports scientists. Okay, we could show it like this with this diagram where we have the basic sciences feeding into both sport and exercise science. They share research and education in common, 
okay? Um, but then we see in the service component a little bit of a differentiation. We see strength and conditioning being shared as a shared service between exercise and sports science. But in exercise science, it's more geared toward fitness and wellness. Whereas in sports science, it's geared toward athlete monitoring and testing and sport performance. So what is athlete monitoring then? Well, in brief, because we've covered this before, in athlete monitoring, we strive to make the black box clear. We strive to shed light on the training process by actually measuring it. We do it with some sort of a model like this. This conceptual model was adapted from uh, the way I learned it at ETSU under Dr. Michael Stone, where we have these three compartments. And if you look at the figure, we have the training compartment where there is a, a sport coach and a strength and conditioning coach, sometimes a skills coach also, who impart a training stimulus onto the athlete. There's also athlete, uh, outside stressors that uh, contribute to the stress that the athlete is subjected to. Then what we can do is we have a monitoring program, and depending on the size of your program, depending on how many people you have helping you, depending on the funds you have available, uh, the, monitor, the monitoring can be less or more robust. At its most robust, you would be measuring performance, training volume, mood status, fatigue status, health status, etc. We can measure all of those with different tools, different questionnaires, or just some of them. Uh, we all start somewhere. And then the sports science staff, which is oftentimes the strength and conditioning coach. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to be a strength coach, the sports science staff is less applicable to me. I would encourage you to think again because oftentimes it's the job of the strength coach who understands the training process better than anyone else to assimilate this data. Okay? No matter where you start, it's the strength coach who's going to start assimilating this data. Maybe it's just volume loads. Maybe it's just sets and reps and weights. Okay? Or maybe it's just RPEs, session RPEs, or even uh, lift RPEs. Okay? Something as simple as that can pay big dividends in the training process. Okay, so the sports science staff takes that monitoring data and they do two things with it. The first priority is always to feed it back to the sport coach and to the strength coach. Well, if you are the strength coach, then you get the data, uh, you know, because you're the strength coach. But uh, if you're the sports scientist, to feed it back to the strength and conditioning coach and to the sport coach. Because then they are the ones steering the program. Really, the sport coach is, but the strength coach is steering the physical preparedness. And with that data, it can help inform their decisions. And oftentimes, the data that you give them is really just telling them what they already know, but it gives them a little bit more certainty and a bit more nuance in what they already know. Okay? The sport coach can tell that the players are tired. The strength coach knows that the players are tired because their outputs are low. You just tell them what the outputs actually were and how many standard deviations below normal that they were on that day. So you can get a, a more uh, granular understanding of that. Right? And then the second thing, so that's the primary thing. The second thing that the sports science staff does is then we take that data and we um, try to uncover that truth, okay? We do research with it. And in a university setting, in an embedded athlete monitoring setting, which we're talking about today, you do that in conjunction with the uh, academics departments, kinesiology department or exercise science or sports science, whatever it's called at your university, um, the dietetics department, psychology maybe, sports medicine. And you, along with those professionals and or students, use it for research. Okay? Of course, it has to be approved by the Institutional Review Board, et cetera, et cetera. But as long as you've done that, then you can use it for research. And many of you guys are doing that for your thesis and capstone projects. So through that process, now we know what's in the box, as we've talked about before in this class. Okay? So moving on to some new definitions for most of you, step one in evidence-based practice, okay? This is important for laying the groundwork for an embedded sport uh, and monitoring program. So step one is to turn information need into a researchable question. You have a need to understand how to make your athletes jump higher, okay? Simple as that, very, very simple need. You need to make your athletes jump higher, you wanna know how to do that. Turn it into a research question. Training modalities to improve lower body power in collegiate basketball athletes. Something as simple as that, but specific. Step two, acquire evidence uh, relative to the question. Okay, so now we're gonna get on PubMed, we're gonna get on Google Scholar, we're gonna start searching. Step three, 
we're going to evaluate the evidence for validity, reliability, impact, applicability. Okay, is the sample similar to your sample? How big was the sample? How robust were those statistics? Remember, uh, you know, getting into your PICO questions, how you were evaluating those different research studies, and you've had whole classes on how to do that. We evaluate that evidence. How many studies are saying one thing versus another thing? What's the nuance? Are there any uh, summative reviews or narrative reviews or meta-analyses that ask the same question and have uh, accumulated all of that research for you to answer that question? If not, then it's your job to gather it. Step four is to integrate that evidence into decision making. Okay, based on what you found, which training modality should you incorporate next? And are your athletes ready for that training modality? Okay. And then step five, once you've implemented it, then you audit it, the outcomes and the evidence. So did your athletes actually jump higher? What were their jumps pre and post? We have to test. This is the importance of monitoring. And then you just repeat the process. You rinse and repeat, okay? So turn information into a question, acquire evidence uh, toward that question, evaluate the evidence, integrate the evidence into decision-making and into the training process, and you audit it, okay? You test outcomes pre and post, and probably during as well. Okay, so going on with this theme of evidence-based practice, um, it's a cyclical approach, and there's kind of two sides of the coin. This is one side, which consists of the practitioner's professional judgment, so you as a practitioner, um, using your knowledge, your training, your certifications, you have to make judgment calls about the training process, where to go next, which exercises to prescribe, for which athletes, under which conditions. You need to know and consult the best applicable, available research and have goals and values uh, of the coaches, your sport coaches that you serve, and the athletes in mind at all times. Okay, maybe the sport coach has a goal of, um, I don't know, like running a strategy that involves more high-speed running than what you're used to, let's say on a soccer team, right? A lot of back and forth. And so the coach is saying, I need my guys to be faster. I need my girls to be faster. And they might, might not be able to quantify it exactly, but it's your job to help them to do that. And then to steer your training process in that direction that the coach wants to take it. Okay, on the other side of that, you start to develop some real world experience and you start to see the complexities and the challenges inherent in the training process. Maybe as the coach is saying, hey, I want my athletes to be quicker, maybe you're realizing that there are some limitations that are holding certain key athletes back, okay? And then maybe contrary to some of the research that you're reading, maybe you have some experiential evidence where that training modality that looked really good in the research, you implemented it and it actually didn't lead to great results for your athletes in your context, okay? Or during that period of the season. Okay, and then there's also contextual evidence. So what are the injuries? What are the other stresses, the outside stressors that the athletes are under? Um, what is the morale and the uh, team spirit like on your squad? What's the culture like around strength and conditioning? Okay, the culture matters a lot. So what's the contextual evidence? So all of these things, both sides of these coin, uh, or this coin, feed into how you can uh, construct a training program, okay? And this is important because when we're, when we're making an athlete monitoring program, uh, we need to take into account what the strength coach is doing. How are they operating with the team? When you have evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence, uh, you can avoid being just like sort of a rote sort of cookbook coach, a coach that just sticks to the program and doesn't adjust. And you can avoid being sort of that Un, not uneducated, but um, unevidence-based sort of guru, okay? So let me explain both of those. If you take clinical practice guidelines, like if you take the CSCS book and you just distill it down into a bunch of like if-then statements, okay, if we're in this part of the season, then we do this set and rep scheme. If it's this type of athlete, then we do these certain exercises. Then you're just prescribing training based on a cookbook. You're not an actual coach, right? An app could probably do a better job. If, on the other hand, you don't follow anything, any of the guidelines, and you're going kind of based on feel and based on sort of these loose definitions of training um, principles, then you're more of the guru, okay? You're more of the guru who's kind of going by feel. Maybe there's something missing in the literature, in the textbooks, in the guidelines, and based on your experience and your knowledge of the athletes and their culture and their context. Okay, that's where the art and the science of coaching really merge. 
Okay? So now, given the sports science definitions, given what you know now of athlete monitoring and the entire uh, conceptual model for it, and evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence, um, let me just show you here at Point Loma how the embedded sports science program has unfolded, okay? And I'll start by showing you what it looked like at ETSU, where I went to grad school. I was there for five years, two years for the master's, and three for the PhD, so I spent a lot of time uh, getting to understand this program. And I, I also included on this slide the total revenue of the athletics department, just so you get a, an idea for kind of like the size of the athletics department. So ETSU was a Division I program, and at ETSU, all of the grad students were the strength coaches. So we didn't have a strength and conditioning head coach or staff. We just had every single grad student working with various teams. And so we were given a team to be in charge of when we uh, entered the program. Now, we weren't in charge right away. There was usually a, a PhD student who had been there for a few years who was kind of like our head coach. And we came in as the assistant coach or really as the intern until we learned the ropes. And then eventually, as we sort of matriculated throughout the process, we became the head coach. We also were the sports scientists. As sports scientists, we fully understood the training process that the teams were going through because we were the ones prescribing it. So we did the training, we also did the sports science. It worked really well. So at ETSU, uh, in the, sort of the battle days as I call them, this is me participating in research. Remember when I told you guys participate in people's research? That was me doing like 400 pound half squats and then having to jump right afterwards doing a potentiation study. It'd be like for your study, Justin, that you're doing. Okay, so in this video, that was our isometric mid thigh pull rig. So before we had really sleek ones like what we have in the lab now, they had these huge Frankenstein racks with literal car jacks underneath it to get like really minute changes in bar height. And uh, it took like four people just to move the bar up and down because the bar was welded in place. And then we had to unclamp it. There's clamps and pins to move it up and down. And then it's also spring loaded. It's total pain in the butt. And one day I'll show you guys a picture of how we actually calibrated these force plates. We had to stack 20, 25 kilo plates per plate, one at a time, and graph the curve on Excel to get the actual or like voltage to Newton signal to put that calibration equation into the analysis program. It was wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, yeah. And, and as for, and when you come in as a master's student, guess who's the one loading all those plates? <laughs> oh, and actually that's what this slide's kind of about. So the, in the battle days, this is, this is how I learned sports science, was five years at ETSU in the converted racquetball courts that we used as labs with these kind of proto-isometric mid-thigh pull rigs. It took four people, as I said, just to move the bar up and down. Uh, we had really old computers, Windows 2000 desktop machines that were very slow, and these old force platforms that took about an hour to calibrate. But now, here at Point Loma, we have a much smaller athletics program, and again, I'm just wanting to illustrate what you can do with a little. You can do a lot with a little, okay? And then we have the conceptual sports science model or the conceptual athlete monitoring model that I put together and pitched to the athletic department with the help of Eric. Uh, when I got here. Much smaller total revenue for the program, but we've been able to do a lot. Uh, this is footage from San Diego Legion testing. Some of you guys were involved, not with this one, this was two years ago. We have a full suite of vault equipment. We have dedicated lab space, portable isometric mid thigh pull rigs, tablet, cloud-based uh, data collection system, portable technology. You guys really have it good. You don't realize how good until now maybe. Uh, but yeah, so we've come, kind of come a long way from 10 years ago even. The technology is accelerating, okay? So let me get into some of the lessons that we learned setting up this monitoring program, okay? It's important to know that wherever you all go next after this, these lessons and these um, takeaways may not apply directly to your setting, but some of them will, and others you can tweak and then they'll fit, okay? So your mileage may vary. This is based on my experience and Eric's experience setting this all up. Okay, so some lessons that we've learned and what I've done is I've tried to separate these into categories for you guys, 
Okay, so do your best to project in your mind forward to uh, your future jobs, or maybe if you're interning right now, or if you have a job right now, be thinking about how can I do sports scientist, athlete, athlete monitoring in my current position. Think about the obstacles that you might encounter, and then maybe some things that I'll say here might apply. Okay, so the first obstacle, one, I don't have the team of people to operate a robust monitoring program, okay? We didn't have that when I got here. It was just me and Eric. Number two, can't establish an in with the athletics or exercise science department, okay? So maybe you're a strength coach. You don't have access to exercise science or kines. Maybe, you're, maybe you become a professor or you're currently a student. You don't have access to athletics, okay? And another obstacle that I had was I didn't personally know any of the sport coaches, as I've told you all before. Okay, so solutions. The first solution for me was, and for us in creating this program, was one, volunteers. So we just asked people like, hey, do you want to come help us do this testing thing? And they'd never heard of it, and we showed them how to run it. And they're like, yeah, this is awesome. We get to like be down here with the athletes. This is really cool. Number two, grad assistants. So slave labor, AKA, right? So people who are here in our program who want experience, we can give them experience and we don't have to pay them anything. In fact, they pay us, not us, but the school. Um, and it works out pretty well. Sport coaches, sometimes we're like, hey coach, like we don't have enough people for the session today. Do you mind running the force plates? Or do you mind run, you know, timing the warmups or whatever? Um, and then also sports medicine. So sometimes athletic trainers will come and assist as well, and they like to geek out about this stuff too, okay? Solution for the second one, um, go through pre-established channels, okay? In other words, get to know the strength coach. So I didn't know any of the sport coaches with the exception of knowing the women's soccer coach, but I did know Eric, and we lifted together, and, and we became friends, and so through him and his good relationship with each of the sport coaches, we were able to, not finagle, but we were able to sort of set it up so that he he made testing part of his training program, which was mandatory with the athletes anyways. Um, so the athletes went through his training, which now had a testing component to it. It made what he did better. It gave good results to the coaches, and it allowed me to set up this monitoring program without having to go sit in every single coach's office and try to convince them, okay? The strength coach is actually like the gateway. He's like the side gateway through that impenetrable wall into the athletics department if you get to know him or her. Or maybe you are the strength coach and you can help a sports scientist get in the back door into athletics and to start a monitoring program for the betterment of the athletes. Okay, sometimes you can go through the front door, but that side door is nice too. Okay, the next set of lessons in budget and technology. So obstacles, first obstacle that you might encounter Maybe your funds for research, scholarship, and travel are limited. How do you share equipment between the athletics department and the kinesiology department? And again, this is in a university setting. Some of you are going into the private setting, so you might be sharing between teams or between coaches, etc. And maybe you can only afford one piece of equipment. You're used to here at Point Loma, we have just about anything that you could want, but maybe you just have the funds for one piece of equipment. What do you do? Okay, and maybe you don't have a dedicated lab space. All right, so solutions here. Uh, one, you can get really creative with funding, okay? Internal funding, external funding. If you're at a university, part, like let's say you're a university strength coach, partner with exercise science because they typically have access to internal grants that they can apply for. They do a research study, they might get a couple thousand dollars towards it, and boom, there you go, you have timing gates, or you have, half of a force plate, <laughs> or you have, you know, some other, maybe you have a, a dynamo or something that you can start to use, okay? Um, sharing between departments, so athletics and academics, it can work, and it works when you have good relationships, but your mileage may vary. It takes a lot of, uh, a lot, I do this because I'm always texting Eric about where the force plates are at any given moment, bringing them between both campuses. Uh, it requires communication. Okay, you gotta communicate. Jose knows, he's always on those text threads. Okay, if you can only f afford one piece of equipment, you better make sure it, you're gonna use it. It should be a cornerstone piece of technology. So for us, we started off with just Hawk and Dynamics force plates. I say just, but those are really a very robust tool that honestly, if I had to build the entire program with just one piece of equipment, it would be with that piece of equipment. Okay, so choose a cornerstone piece of tech. Is it a barbell accelerometer for you? Okay, is it a gym aware? Uh, is it GPS, uh, like Catapult or, or something like that, Stat Sports or something? Okay, 
choose your cornerstone tech and then save for it, get that funding and just start there and ride that process. Let that create a culture of um, objective, quantitative uh, monitoring for your training program. The other thing, the other important thing is that sports science can be really low tech, okay? Uh, reps in reserve, RPE scales, session RPEs, these are the lowest of the low tech and they're probably one of the best tools that you can use as a sports scientist. You keep track of these and you keep track of uh, session duration and now you have the training impulse scores. You can do a lot with that. You can compute uh, acute to chronic workload ratio, you know, an estimate of it. And um, you know, maybe that does or doesn't correlate with injury potential, but you can at least start tracking some things, okay? And you can start to quantify your training sessions. Okay, the next set of lessons is regarding buy-in. Not every athlete is gonna to wanna to test. Not every coach is going to believe in the testing that you're doing or find it useful. Here are some of the obstacles. First, metrics from the technology can be foreign and they lack traditional face value. Okay, who here has a conceptual, like really visceral understanding of what a Newton is? A couple people. Do you know how many Newtons you weigh? Do you know how much force you can produce in Newtons? Right, not everyone does. And a couple of us do, maybe because we work with the force plates a lot or you work with athletes a lot and you're always thinking in Newtons, but coaches don't, right? Most of them don't. So we have to be able to translate that for them. Sometimes sport coaches have the, have the mindset of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They see force plates, they see gym awares, they see these complex spreadsheets, they see um, you know, individual joint by joint isometric testing, and they think, oh, that's like a lot of time for something that's not broke. Why would we invest all this time, okay? Novel equipment can add ambiguity to the testing experience. Athletes can come in and see these, this new weird technology or these different testing protocols and they don't know what they're doing. Okay, they might not understand the training process. And in my mind, I think it's important to educate the athletes at least a little bit to why they're doing what they're doing. Okay, and then finally, this is, this is a really big problem. Uh, the data isn't being used in decision making. So let's say you're doing some sports science and that data sits there on a spreadsheet. And guess what, I'm really guilty of this as well, <laughs> as guilty as anyone else, of collecting data and letting it just sit on a spreadsheet doing nothing with it. We don't wanna do that, okay? So what are the solutions? First, understanding the limitations of current testing practices, okay? Not every test can tell you everything, all right? Not every test can tell you everything. And also, we need to be certain that, that those few tests that we choose to do that they're telling us what we think they're telling us. So how is your standardization practices around that test? That's very important. We need to be able to then communicate the results of the test, uh, communicate the value of the results through post-testing meetings, data visualizations, and comparisons to coach observations. Okay, so if you're not meeting with your team within a week of testing, saying, hey coach, here are the results, and not just the numbers, but an actual data visualization, and not just a visualization, but also a discussion around, hey coach, what did, what did you see in that last game? Here's what the data is showing. Where do those things line up? How can we help to explain what you think you saw, uh, you know, in the, I don't know, in the second half, when you were talking about uh, this subset of players seeming to slow down or lacking, uh, you know, lacking the ability to be on the ball as quickly. Okay, here's what we saw in the data. Okay, so you're comparing to their observations, you're visualizing it, and then we're creating buy-in through conversations with athletes based on monitoring and testing results. So this is why I always say when you have athletes jump, tell them to jump right away. Tell them how high that was right away. Compare that to their last jump, okay? They should, they should know, they should understand on any given day or any given testing day um, how they're performing and what that is like in relation to their other teammates and to themselves um, in previous results. We don't want our data to look like that. Too much data, can't compute it, okay? Now, in this sports science process, we go through some sort of a miracle with that data, and then suddenly it looks like this nice, clean dashboard. Now we can understand, we can give this to coaches. This is kind of our goal. This is how we generate buy-in, is we create these visualizations, we explain them, and we have conversations around them.
Okay, the next set of lessons is in expertise. So maybe you leave here and you get to your next job um, or your first job or whatever, your next gig, and you need to use fill in the blank piece of technology or you need to do fill in the blank protocol, okay? You don't know how to do it. That's an obstacle. Maybe you don't know how to make sense of, bless you. Don't let that happen again, please. <laughs> Just, I kid, I kid. Um, maybe you don't know how to make sense of certain variables, okay? Maybe you don't know how to communicate the meaning of the data succinctly, all right? And that's what we practice in class all the time. So hopefully you guys do feel like you can do that, but um, there's always new data to communicate, all right? Now here's what we did, obviously. We consulted the literature first. That's a great place to find answers, okay? But also, so is Google and YouTube. <laughs> There's a lot of technology documentation out there in video format, and I don't know about you, but sometimes watching a video explains something t 10 times faster than reading the user manual, okay? So use Google, use YouTube. When I run into problems with Excel, which is all, all the time, always, um, I just ask YouTube, I ask Google, it's the best teacher. So as a sports scientist, don't think that just because you have a degree or a fancy CPSS designation that you're done learning, you're always learning. Um, and then practice. So uh, for this last one, how to communicate the meaning of data, practice as much as possible with your interns, with students, with athletes, with coaches. Just practice talking to them about data, discussing RSI values, discussing peak force uh, during an isometric mid-thigh pull, okay? Looking at forced time curve tracings, talking about, uh, you know, sprint distance run during the game based on the GPS data, okay? Just talk about that data more and you'll get more adept at it, okay? So, have you guys ever used this? Let me Google that for you, like if, when someone asks kind of a dumb question. I used to do this, I don't do this anymore because students get their feelings hurt too easily, but <laughs> if I had a student email me a question and I'm like, Really? Like you emailed me? It would have been way quicker to Google it. I'll send them back the link. You can go to let me Google that for you and you Google something and then it will do, it will create like this GIF that just shows you typing it into Google and then you can send that back to them. It's kind of a, I don't know. It's kind of mean, it's kind of passive aggressive, but try it sometime. It's kind of fun. Um, <clears throat> okay, lessons and time availability because running an athlete monitoring program takes a lot of time. So an obstacle that we had, we only had one piece of blank equipment, okay? One set of force plates, one force frame, one set of timing gates, etc. Testing large group needs to be time efficient, okay? Large groups needs to be time efficient. Um, what if we have 30 uh, baseball players and we have two hours to test? What are we going to do? How do we meet the NCAA guidelines of a certain number of hours, of contact hours, in season or out of season, or what have you? What, happen, how, what happens when equipment adds um, an unreliable variable to the data collection? Okay, maybe the force plates aren't connecting to the tablets. Maybe you don't have Wi-Fi. Maybe the force plates are glitching, all right? Um, there's always some sort of a tech um, problem that can, that can um, hurt your, your testing session. Solutions we found. Uh, first, determine the time cost of batch testing. So what if you get small groups of athletes to come and test throughout the day? You don't have to test them all at once. Test them throughout the day. Of course, you have to account for that in your standardization practices, but that is one solution. Another is to be very well versed in the super sophisticated rebooting troubleshooting process. Okay, so when you can encounter a problem with the technology, because you have this fancy sports science degree when you leave, you're gonna know about the really sophisticated power cycling. Turn it off, turn it back on, you'll fix it, okay? And then also always have a backup plan, okay? Always have a backup plan. You can't jump on the force plates? Well, there's a bunch of apps that you can estimate jump height from. Don't have the apps? Well, maybe you have a Vertec. Maybe you have the old put chalk on your hand and slap on the wall. You need to have some way of testing them because you know people did sports science well before they had force plates. So you should always have a backup plan. Okay, so that's, that's all of our lessons. That was a lot. That was a lot of, that, that was like six years of lessons distilled into a few slides. So hopefully you guys took something from that and you can take something into your current uh, internship or into your future jobs. How do we create an actionable framework though for athlete monitoring? 
Okay, so a conceptual foundation to think about is this one of measuring, evaluating, and operationalizing the data. If you get lost in this whole sports science thing, this uh, contraption that we call athlete monitoring, just remember all you're doing is you're measuring an important thing, you're making an, eva an evaluation of that measurement. Is it good? Is it bad? How does it compare? and then you're doing something about it. You're operationalizing it. You're using that evaluation and you're allowing it to influence the training process. Okay, my athletes are really strong, but they can't jump. So I'm gonna give them plyos. <laughs> that is sports science. Okay, that is the measure, evaluate, operationalize uh, kind of in a nutshell. Oh, and then you repeat. That's the fourth step. Measure, evaluate, operate, repeat. Okay, so that was step one. Step two is know that sports science always happens or athlete monitoring always happens in a network of relationships. You, as a sports scientist at the top left or a strength coach at the top right, you're just one of the many support staff surrounding these athletes. Okay, they have the sport coach for sure. And in a high performance environment, they probably have registered dietitian. They probably have a physio or a physical therapist probably an athletic trainer. <laughs> um, there's probably an MD. There's probably a bunch more people that I didn't include on this um, graphic because it wouldn't have been symmetrical or pretty and I ran out of colors. But there's a lot of people and you're just one of them. You're just one of them. Oftentimes though, the sports scientist is the person who could be like the glue, who has, you know, they're kind of the center of the web and maybe I'm just saying that because I'm a sports scientist and I, <laughs> you know. Um, but you understand a lot of the different disciplines, and so you can help to translate between them, between the di different expertises. Okay, the other thing that we did here at Point Loma, um, after that MEO process, and then understanding that Eric and I, the strength coach and I, were just two of many, um, is that we built what we call a service-first approach. So the idea is that we educate you guys, the students, in the athlete monitoring paradigm, and there's a bunch of, you don't have to read through all this, this is just uh, what I send to students, what I used to send to students when they wanted to get involved in, involved in athlete monitoring before everyone just sort of got involved. So we educate the students, then the students, once they understand the technology, they can serve the athletes by helping with testing sessions and helping prepare the data for data returns. And then we do research with that. But the service comes first, okay? So if you're doing athlete monitoring, Think of it as a way to serve the athletes first, and you'll get a lot more done. If you think about it as a way to get your research needs met, or your capstone project, or because you think sports science is cool, you're not gonna get a lot done, okay? Because sport support teams exist to support the athletes. So if you're supporting the athletes, you're probably gonna get a lot more done. Okay, the fourth thing we did is we tried to create a culture of mentorship, okay? Everybody is in continuing education. You all are literally in your education right now as students, but even outside of the classroom, we expect you to be learning on your own, self-directed learning, coming in outside of class to learn extra hours, whether it's reading, whether it's in the lab, whether it's observing, whether it's your internships, okay? And Eric and I, the strength coach, we are always uh, also pursuing continuing education, whether that is attending conferences, uh, reading research, et cetera. Okay, but then underneath us, we have uh, grad assistants and grad students, and underneath you all, we have undergrad students who are coming up as well. Okay, so it's like multiple layers of mentorship, right? And then of course, I have mentors who I still keep in touch with uh, and get advice from, or like Dr. Alvar is one of those people. Okay, so this layered, mentorship approach where everybody is pulling the person underneath them up. The fifth thing that we did was we picked a piece of cornerstone technology and it was the force plates that we got. They're reliable, they made sense, the metrics made sense to us for what we wanted to collect. We based a lot of our collection just around this at first. Before we had anything else, we had force plates and we relied on those to help us make training insights. And then finally, the sixth part of that framework is just cranking the flywheel. Every year we did something a little better, a little better, a little better. And as you crank it, the idea with a flywheel is that 
the more you crank, the faster it spins. And then it just starts spinning on its own. And you just have to give little cranks here and there, right? At first, it was Eric and I at every single testing session running it by ourselves, 6 a.m. or 3 p.m. or 5 p.m. or whenever it was, we were always there, okay? And now we have this whole robust thing going where it's GAs and grad students and there's research projects and we have all this equipment and it's really grown, right? From this simple flywheel to maybe this like really super complex thing that I don't really even understand. Um, and it just grows, it, it becomes an entity in and of itself just because we just kept cranking the flywheel and following those steps. Okay, so I think that is, oh yeah, that's the end. There's our soccer team. That won the national championship this last year, yeah. Um, yeah, congrats to them. Congrats to them. Um, <clears throat> and a small part of that was some of the sports science that we got to do with them. You see Haley, uh, one of my former grad students, uh, she was running the GPS for them last year. So that is, that was our journey in creating an embedded athlete monitoring program. Hopefully you all can take some of those lessons, maybe one of those lessons with you to wherever you end up next. All right, what questions do you have? Yes. There's one slide that said YMMV. What did that say? Oh, your mileage may vary. Okay. Yeah. So like, uh, I think that was the caveat before the lessons of like, this is what we did. It may work for you, but it, it may not. Your mileage may vary. Other questions? Yes, Ava. If you could only use one sports science modality, which would you choose? Really good question. Um, for sure, this would be second place, not first place. First place would be, sorry, I got to go way back. This, RPEs, if I could only use one. Nothing fancy, sports science can be low tech. Other questions? Yes. At what point did you realize you're collecting too much data and what was the bet that you decided to trim off? Mm, great question. Um, many points along the way I have realized yet again <laughs> how much data we have that we're not using. The hard part with that is, you know, when you, let's say you do a jump and you get 100 variables. Well, you have to do the jump to get the couple variables that you're interested in. Um, so it's a continually evolving process. Maybe one year you rely on jump height, MRSI, and um, I don't know, asymmetry as kind of your triangulation of how that athlete is jumping. And then the next year you realize, uh, well, we actually also want to look at some measure of absolute and relative power. So maybe now it's like peak propulsive power and peak propulsive power allometrically scaled. Okay, it's, it evolves and we maybe, uh, I don't want to say throw out because we still have the data. We just don't look at all the variables all the time. Um, have we ever collected something that we haven't used just straight up? Mm, yeah, I would say there's been times when we've done like pre-testing and then never did post-testing due to different NCAA like scheduling things. That always, ugh, that just hurts. But like for Eric, that's kind of his reality. He's like, I can't ask them to come in and test again. Like, I just can't. I, I can ask them and they can voluntarily come in, you know, and so maybe five students show up out of 25. But for, for the sports science part, like we can't really use that data for research. But for those five athletes who tested, yeah, they have a more complete, we have a more complete look at their training. So yeah, I would say most of the time it's the contextual real kind of boots on the ground obstacles that keep us from using the data that we collected.